uh, while people are joining in uh, for the, um, the meeting, just because we want to, um, to keep uh, on time. So I'd like to welcome all of you and uh, for this uh, first session on the Nexus. What uh, we are planning to do is I'm going to give you a short introduction on the context in which we are organizing this uh, webinar uh, series. And uh, I will then give the floor uh, to my colleagues who will take you through the session. So um, I'm Domiti Valle, I'm um, uh, coordinating a regional project on implementing the 2030 agenda on efficiency, productivity and sustainability of water in the Near East and North Africa region. You see here the logo water productivity, efficiency and sustainability. And um, in the context of this project, we are working with eight countries from this region, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, and Iran. Obviously, the topic is of interest to most of the uh, countries of the Near East and North Africa region and many countries in the world. I mean, water scarcity is an issue shared by many. Under that project, we have three main components that we focus on. One that is on understanding better the situation of water resources on their use, using the approach of water accounting and auditing, auditing being the water governance assessment. If you're interested, we have a session tomorrow. So in case we can uh, share with you the link in case you want to follow that session on water auditing. Um, we have a second component that aim to understand how agriculture, the main water user, can do better with the water it has. So uh, more crop per drop, uh, so understanding that you can uh, potentially increase the return and by um, uh, quantity of water you are using and potentially reducing the quantity of water to get more. The third one is understanding how you just uh, inform strategic planning and knowing, accepting the fact that you have multiple strategies and policies that may have uh, different objectives. And that's the case of water, agriculture and energy. And that's why we have this component looking, focusing on the, on the nexus water, agriculture and energy, because we know that the interaction and the interrelation are increasing. And particularly as agriculture is, uh, have to depend, for example, on deep, uh, groundwater resources or uh, modern technology to power and uh, uh, create pressure in his um, pipelines. So uh, on this, I'd like to stop here on the presentation of the project. If you're interested uh, to follow more uh, closely uh, the information, we'll share with you the email of the project so that you can send us a message to have more information and uh, we will put also the link of the website. And uh, now I'd like to introduce the, the group, um, the speakers who will just take you through the session today. Uh, first, we have uh, Annette Huberli, who is a senior scientist with the Stockholm Environmental Institute. We will have also uh, Youssef Ab uh, Abdullah, who is a, a junior scientist with the KTH, KTH, which is the Royal Institute of Technology uh, of Stockholm in Sweden. And then we have Francesco Fusenerini, who is also associate professor of uh, KTH. And uh, Francesco, I will give him the floor. He will act as a facilitator for this session. So I wish you a very good uh, webinar. And I look forward to I mean, hearing the presentation as all of you do. So Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Domitil, and, and thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, in, in this webinar series that is uh, being uh, uh, organized by the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, a bit of introduction on the webinar series uh, that starts today. Uh, as, as a broad uh, objective is to share best practices and give an understanding of what the uh, terms nexus mean. And in this case, we will especially look at the nexus between water, food, and energy resources. Um, then in this series, we will look at uh, how to manage and identify Nexus challenges, but also once one identifies those challenges, how to find solutions to those challenges. And to find solutions, which tools can be used to 
quantify and analyze those solutions and then uh, use them uh, in policy and in decisions. Um, and throughout the webinar series, we will uh, uh, draw from expertise in different case studies with a special focus, uh, given also the focus of uh, the project uh, in the Near East uh, North Africa region. Um, Domitil started introducing uh, the uh, series, but uh, just to recap, uh, today is the fourth sec uh, section in which we look at uh, identifying Nexus challenges with some specific examples that you will see. The next one, that is two weeks from now, will focus more on Nexus solutions and I focus even more on the examples of Jordan and Morocco that are two focus country in the project that Domitil introduced. Uh, the next two so, uh, sessions, we will uh, dig in in other case studies and best practices, looking at Lebanon, Maghreb and West Africa. Uh, and then we will return with the uh, fifth uh, part of this webinar series, uh, really looking at what uh, the tools can, can do to support decision making in the Nexus process. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, I'll leave the word to my colleague, uh, Annette huber -Lee from the Soko Environmental Institute. Thank you, Francesco, and, and thank you, Donatia, for the, the introduction to the series. Um, as, as noted on the previous slide, we're open to hearing from other colleagues. <clears throat> I think we might uh, be privileged to hear from our colleagues in Iran for a, a six um session of this webinar series so please know we're open to hear from all of you i'm excited to see the enthusiasm in uh, in the number of people who are interested in listening to us today So for today, when, what we really like to dig into is understanding a little bit more about the nexus and, and sharing with you one particular approach to explore the nexus that we used in the context of the project um, with FAO looking at Morocco and Jordan, and then actually get right into some applications of identifying nexus challenges, um, looking at different scales. So starting with a subnational scale with the Sous Massa, in Morocco, then moving to a national scale in Jordan, and then looking transboundary in the context of the Northwestern Sahara Aquifer System in Northern Africa. And then we'd actually like to brainstorm with you. We'd like to learn from you as well. Um, so we'll start out by, I will talk a little bit about the nexus and what value the, and the exploring the nexus brings, what it does and doesn't do. Um, a little bit about the methodology we used in the context of this water sustainability project. And then I'll hand over to Youssef, who will showcase the implementation of this methodology in the various case studies. Francesco, I might need you to do the, <laughs> the slide. So starting out with what is the nexus? I imagine most of you know what the nexus is, and, um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the value of exploring the nexus. So next slide. So, so what is the, the nexus? I mean, there are many <laughs> nexi out there. <laughs> the one that we're focused on is really looking at the nexus between water, food, and energy. And in particular, you know, the, we think about water supply, obviously, um, for domestic purposes, but it plays a role in food production. Um, but in that food production, it can also, you know, say, the use of fertilizers and pesticides can lead to contamination of the water. So there's some feedback loops between food and water. Similarly, water can provide hydropower energy uh, power plants often need water for cooling purposes. So how do we look at the interconnections between these sectors that are often in separate ministries 
separate disciplines, and we're typically not trained to think about these, the implications between and the interactions between these different sectors. Next slide. So uh, Francesca will guide us through, we'll have different brainstorming interactions with you along the way. Um, yes, and, and to do that, uh, we would like to, as, as you are quite a few people, uh, to hear your uh, opinions and, and, some, and answer some questions in Mentimeter. So for those of you that uh, have not used Mentimeter, you can go on your phone, on your computer, any device with internet to menti.com. You will be asked a code, uh, and uh, you can enter this code, the 13.55.89.1. Um, and then you can leave it open, actually, because then uh, the next questions will appear, so you will not have to enter again the code. Um, so the, the, the first question is, in which category do you most identify with within the WEF Nexus? So some of you might be working with the Nexus, I imagine, but uh, what is your if you have one, what is your primary expertise? Il vous plaît, est-ce que tu peux nous, nous attendre qu'on puisse uh, le, se connecter par uh, portable? In a minute. Yeah, so wait a little, uh, Francesco, so that they can connect with the, with the um, uh, telephone. Yes. Donc, il, il va vous, en fait, euh, le, le système automatiquement entre les, les réponses des uns et des autres. Hein, mais allez-y, connectez-vous. So I'll wait. Uh, one minute for everyone to answer. We already have uh, 30 people and uh, up to now, majority with uh, water as an entry point. Um, but we have also good representation in food, energy and environment. So maybe, um, Francesco, maybe you can repeat um, for, you have some newcomers, so maybe just uh, repeat um, uh, your indications while uh, people are, are filling, because you of have course. newcomers. <laughs> um, so anyone that just came, you can go online at menti.com on any device, add this code when asked, and answer this question. Uh, so which category do you most identify with within the Nexus? Of course, these are not all the sectors. Uh, it's a subset uh, that, that we focus on today, but just to, to understand uh, where people are coming from. Uh, okay, interesting. We already have uh, around 70 answers. Maybe I'll just wait two, three seconds more, and then I'll go to the next question that will appear on your screen on in the same one that you answered this one. But I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that we have uh, uh, people from, from all sectors that we discussed today. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> sign. <right>? Yes. <laughs> and uh, the second question uh, is uh, if before uh, in, in your work life, in your research life, have you ever had the, had to, the chance to implement and look at the water energy food nexus approach? Uh, this looks much more equal than before. Yeah, this is interesting. <laughs> that... Okay, this is much faster. We already have 70 answers. So hopefully we will cover the interest for both people that have worked before with the Nexus and those that are new to the concept. Exactly. Okay, you can keep answering, but I'll, I'll go back to the slides and pass back uh, the word to uh, Annette. Thank you, Francesco. Yeah, I mean, uh, part of the reason that we're doing the work with FAO is uh, a larger goal of achieving um, uh, sustainable development goals. And it'd be easy to kind of look at the sustainable development goals in their, in their strict categories. Um, you know, goal six, focus on water, um, goal two on food and goal seven on energy. But in fact, uh, it, it doesn't take much um, 
interrogation to find that in fact, these goals are interacting with many of the other goals that um, if we want to reduce poverty, you really need sufficient water, energy and food access. For economic growth, you need access to these. To have um, biodiversity, a sustainable ecosystem, you also need to consider how we are obtaining adequate food, energy, and water. So it's important to think about um, in, in achieving sustainable development goals and achieving sustainability broadly, the need to look at how these sectors intersect with almost every dimension of human well being. Next slide. So one approach, I know this looks very complicated <laughs> um, to this though, is to start thinking about um, the cross impacts between within each of these goals or a set of targets. And to sort of think through methodically, how does achieving this target intersect with achieving another target? And so what this matrix is showing us here is where it's gray, it's really achieving this target has no impact on achieving another target. Um, where it's green, achieving this target, say um, sufficient food also contributes to reducing poverty, right? There's positive interactions between achieving goals. Where the nexus comes into play is where we start to see achieving this goal can have negative impacts on achieving a different goal. So you could think about, um, you want to have uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So let's introduce additional hydropower can have negative consequences on irrigation and food production. So a lot of our work is trying to have people think in, in outside the silo that you're trained in or your ministry is working within. And not all nexus interactions are negative. So we don't need to look at everything. We need to focus on where the, uh, there's potential for negative consequences. Next slide. <laughs> Another way of thinking about this is what, what drives us often, let's say um, reactively to do something about the nexus is, uh, you know, so we can be proactive and look at an SDG cross impact matrix, um, but often we end up looking at the nexus because of two primary reasons. There's a scarcity of a resource or a threat. So for example, in, in terms of scarcity, if there's not sufficient water, that has implications in terms of hydropower production, let's say cooling water for power plants or our ability to produce food. And similarly, a, a threat can occur in, in those in those same kind of situations where we're using water for production of biofuels at the cost of not having adequate food production. All of these are exacerbated by climate change where we can have extreme events, increased frequency and intensity of those extreme events. And it, it can impact food production, both irrigated agriculture and rain fed agriculture all of these can lead to crises or conflicts. So sometimes the nexus comes into play because of a crisis. And our goal through this series is to help us think more proactively so we don't get to the point of a conflict or crisis, but think more proactively around the nexus to prevent them from happening. Next slide. And so in, in terms of thinking pro, proactively, how can we plan, how can we develop policies and infrastructure that addresses some of these potential negative consequences of planning in silos rather than thinking coherently? And what we're suggesting here is not to create a new ministry of you know, everything, but rather you know, preserve the existing ministries, but find ways for ministries to talk across what are now mostly silos and develop more coherent policies. And what, what do we mean by policy coherence? It's really you know, looking at the potential for conflict in, in working in isolated ways and actively coordinating across ministries. If I'm planning hydropower, if I'm planning a new irrigation uh, perimeter, let's find ways to talk to each other 
so that we can play out those implications, look for synergy, look for cooperation across common objectives. Next slide. So are these interlinkages already transparent to policymakers? I think we would argue in some cases, yes. In, in some cases, we know that there's tension between hydropower and irrigation. Um, but I think more often than not, we find that these nexus interlinkages are in fact not really explored across ministerial boundaries. Um, so that you are often making, setting goals and, and policies that directly and negatively impact another ministry. And that we find uh, even across borders and transboundary situations, this also comes into play that not really understanding the more regional impacts that large scale infrastructure or policies that involve subsidies of particular, let's say uh, uh, pricing of goods can make a, a big impact. Also often lost in all of this is the role of ecosystems and how ecosystems profoundly support <laughs> our, our water, energy and food access. Um, so uh, it's really important that we start to think proactively and find ways to speak to one another across ministerial boundaries. Next slide. So what we found in our work is that there really is value in doing nexus assessments, um, that they can really facilitate dialogue between sectors and find a, a joint way of prioritizing issues. That it really can lead to ideas around cooperation that haven't come up before. So if, if I can operate hydropower differently that allows food production and food security either within my own country or in a downstream country, let's find ways to, to collaborate. My security <laughs> impacts your security. Uh, very often. So it's important that we find ways that we help each other become water, food, energy, and ecosystem secure. That we can find, there's ways to optimize resources when we think across sectors that wouldn't be apparent otherwise. And really, uh, I think ultimately, the nexus policies and nexus investments are, are of high priority as we look towards an increasingly uncertain future. You know, we think about climate change already is having very severe impacts across the world um, in terms of, in, in ways that I, you know, uh, in my career would have not imagined. In my own country where I speak from right now, wildfires, um, flooding, flood events, hurricanes um, are radically changing the, the world that we live in. And on top of all of that, we layer what we're currently living through in terms of a pandemic. So I think this ability to think across sectors is of increasing importance. Next slide. So I'd like to briefly run by you one method that uh, we found particularly insightful in our work in Jordan and Morocco. But throughout this series, we are going to listen to a number of, of other methods um, that are also equally useful. We'll hear from Lebanon, West Africa, North Africa, and Iran, just to get us started. So next slide. So I have to say this project has been really fun for me personally, because it allowed us to combine uh, two different methods, um, robust decision support that really recognizes sort of deep uncertainty in the world together with a UNECE nexus methodology. Um, both of these are, are participatory in nature, but really emphasize, I think, different aspects of the, the nexus. And so I mentioned the robust decision support, really looking at um, deep uncertainty, but co-development of scenarios and co-development of models with stakeholders to make sure that there's buy-in into the process and uh, transparency in the quantitative approaches that we take. Um, the UNECE method really uh, it 
bring stakeholders together in an interdisciplinary way, qualitatively identifying the linkages between sectors and identifying potential solutions. Quantitative models are often also used um, and, and really exploring explicitly the benefits of cooperation and used in, in thinking about nexus. Next slide. So the conventional planning can be problematic. Often, you know, even one scenario is explored, maybe three scenarios explored, a low, medium, and high, for example. Um, but it fail, fails to consider the possibilities of the future. And in, in fact, the future is, as we know, as we've lived through this last year, we know it's not predictable or well-behaved. And so the point of doing robust decision support is really to explore the, the future that we cannot predict. So there, it could be much higher than we're expecting or much lower than we're expecting. So it, it's, it's really trying to recognize we can't predict the future. What do we do with that uncertainty? How do we find robust or resilient policies and infrastructure in the face of such deep uncertainty? Um, next slide. So more specifically, what we did in the context of Jordan and Morocco was we started with what we call a problem formulation process, where we identified the key stakeholders in Jordan and Morocco, and we worked with them to identify what are the goals that each stakeholder has, what are the deep uncertainties that we face, and what are the strategies, meaning policies, behavioral change, infra infrastructure that we have available to try to achieve those goals, given these deep uncertainties. We took that information, developed a set of, a broad set of scenarios, thousands of scenarios, in fact, and created a quantitative model. Sometimes in the, the context of this work, we use WEEP um, or LEAP, or we do customized software. In the, in the context of the work we did in Jordan, Morocco, it was a combination of, of those tools. And we'll go more deep into the tool aspect in our next webinar in two weeks. Um, but uh, basically ran these models and then used the visualization tools to make that complex set of information more accessible <clears throat> to technical and non-technical people. And, and the goal ultimately then is to use that information to identify robust, policies and infrastructure that we can then act on. It's an iterative process. Um, so we, you know, each time we run the models, we share with stakeholders, it, it helps them explore deeper options um, and we do some iterations. What if we did this instead of that? So we're in that, in the middle of that process right now. We don't have the answers, um, but it's, it's been a pleasure working with colleagues in Jordan and Morocco along the way. So with this, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Youssef, who will talk through some of the examples um, that we're gonna share. I, I forgot to mention, please, if you have questions and comments along the way, um, can you put them in the chat? And at the end, we're going to, to come back to those, um, those questions and, and have a discussion. So please, at any point along the way, feel free to share your, um, your thoughts. We'd like to hear from you. Yeah, so, you. Um, hello, everyone. Yes, uh, I hope everyone can see my screen now. Yeah? Yes, okay. very well. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. So um, uh, thanks, Annette and uh, Francesco and Domatiel for the intro. My name is Yusuf El Mulla from uh, KTH, and it's a pleasure to be with you today to share some um, stories and lessons learned from different applications of the Nexus uh, in selected case studies in the Nina region. As uh, Annette mentioned in um, her presentation, that one of the powerful aspects of the Nexus, that it can be applied into different scales. And uh, in this uh, tour, I would say we will move from a sub-regional case in, in, in Sous Massa in Morocco to a national level in Jordan, to a transboundary or a regional level in uh, the Northwestern Sahara Aquifer System. 
So um, let me start by the first case and the Sous Massa. For those uh, who are not familiar with Sous Massa, let me give a quick introduction for this important province in, um, uh, in Morocco. It's, uh, uh, it's, it has a total area of 27,000 kilometers and it's home for about 2.5 million people. Um, half of them are in rural areas uh, and they rely on agriculture as one of the main activity, if not, if not the main activity in the province. And the importance of Sous Massa for, for Morocco is really significant because it's, um, it contributes to 7% of the GDP. It's the place where most of the high value agricultural products are being cultivated. Um, all the, uh, and the agricultural sector is employing about half of the workforce in Sous Massa. So uh, it is uh, more or less a, a very important uh, socioeconomic activity uh, in Sous Massa, which is contributing to the welfare of the um, province itself, but also to the um, Moroccan GDP. Um, the first step in the analysis uh, when we started the Nexus approach was to do some sort of a, a literature review and understanding of what are the key challenges. And of course, we came up with plenty of uh, challenges or issues that have been identified even before we start this analysis. But most of these issues have been um, sectors sector centered. So for example, there are a lot of issues that have been identified from the agricultural perspective and from the energy perspective and from the water perspective. Uh, and very few had some sort of interlinkages and understanding of the impacts beyond their sectors. So uh, we started by that entry point. Okay, let's move from these sectoral challenges and issues that uh, we see a few examples of them here like the, uh, if we take, for example, the agricultural sector, uh, it's trying to cope with the growing demand, especially for the high value crops that are used for exports and generation of revenue. Uh, this is assuming that we have the available water resources uh, for this particular activity, uh, while the other sectors, for example, the energy are, are, are also considering some other aspects and other activities. Uh, and are facing the challenges of increasing demand for pumping, increasing demand also because of the desalination that's coming online soon. And on top of all of that, we have the water scarcity, which is a common problem, not only in Sousma, not only in Morocco, but in the entire uh, the Nina region. So how to move forward? The, the, the next step was, okay, now we have a couple of uh, sectoral issues. Each sector understands and knows better what are they facing in terms of problems. Now, how to communicate this, how to generate some sort of nexus dialogue between the sectors. So we, in, in this process, we used a number of tools. The, the, the first one, as also Annette highlighted in her presentation, is the participatory nexus workshop. And this is one of the um, pivotal parts of the analysis uh, and, and the, of the also the UNEC methodology that have been implemented in this case, where we bring people from different sectors together, different ministries, uh, the private sector, academia, all of them to set together and to go through the, uh, the mapping of the Nexus challenges that we will show and talk about in the coming slides. Uh, and after doing these mapping, after understanding what are we are facing, then we all set together and say, okay, what are our priorities in the next step and which uh, issues or which challenges we would like to focus on first and then how we can um, coordinate and join our efforts to address these challenges and issues. So the, 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 the first workshop that, was, uh, that you see some pictures of focused on uh, the identification of the Nexus challenges and doing this exercise where you see all these lines between different um, sectors. Um, here is an example that I would like to, to, to go through quickly related to the water scarcity and droughts. We know that droughts, uh, or, or at least in, in the, in the Sous Massa case, are more becoming more frequent and uh, this is affecting the agricultural 
um, uh, uh, land and uh, increasing the demand for irrigation, not only um, the existing or the irrigated areas, but also the rain-fed areas are facing the risk that they will sh soon shift to be irrigated, which is additional demand for irrigation. And this is, of course, adding to the stress of the, um, of the irrigation and um, the already overexploited water resources, uh, which calls for basin management and coordination. Uh, when we, fa we are facing overexploitation, which means that the water table levels are going um, lower, we need to maybe pump from a larger distances. And this is again, uh, calling for more or demanding for more energy to be uh, available for these activities. Since most of these of the current pumping uh, happening using fossil fuel based uh, techniques, either butane uh, for the standalone applications or getting electricity from the grid, which is again uh, being generated by fossil fuels. So this is affecting the environment and generating emissions um, that are harming the environment, but all, and also having negative impact on the ecosystems. Uh, and of course, affecting also the, bio, the biodiversity. The increase in the energy demand means increasing the cost of the products. And at the end, it's affecting the revenues of the farmers. So as we can see, the water scarcity challenge is not a water problem only. It doesn't affect the water sector only, but it impacts, goes beyond the water sector and requires first a deep understanding by all the partners, by all the stakeholders, by all the sectors. And uh, uh, secondly, it requires coordinated planning and coordinated actions by everyone to be able to address this challenge adequately. Uh, another example from the uh, energy demand and or the energy sector, and we also did a, a similar mapping of the interactions and the impacts of these um, uh, challenges on different sectors. But uh, due to the limited time, I will skip this and focus on another example in the other case. Um, so after mapping different challenges, not only the ones that I showed, these are just a few examples, but we had plenty of these challenges. Then we uh, set to an important stage, which is, okay, now what are our priorities? What do we need to prioritize as a uh, as SUS Massa, not the water sector in SUS Massa, not the agricultural sector, but all of us, what are our priorities in the next um, period? So we used a, um, a similar approach with Mentimeter that we tried all together at the beginning of the session. And here are the results. And so water scarcity and drought was the priority number one, then the energy sufficiency and independence, and then agricultural productivity, and lastly, but not least, the water quality and the need for desalination. Um, so this kind of a common understanding now made the picture clear for everyone, where are our priorities and where our efforts should focus, and what are the steps that we need to take uh, to address these challenges. In the next session, uh, in uh, session number two, uh, that will be, I think in two weeks time, my colleagues uh, will, will take us through the solution part uh, and how we take these nexus challenges to the next phase. But now let me move to the uh, next case study to, to Jordan. And here we, uh, again, let me, let me give a quick background about uh, the challenges that are um, uh, apparent in Jordan. So um, we have 90% of the population in urban areas and a city like Amman is uh, being crowded and populated and high dense population, which, uh, which makes uh, huge stress on, the diff on different resources, water, food, and all of that. Um, Jordan is one of the lowest, uh, is classified as the country where, uh, where has the lowest water availability per capita. And just to give some, some numbers and some, uh, to have this in perspective. So the, um, uh, the threshold for water scarcity is about 500 uh, cubic meters per capita per year. The uh, renewable resources in Jordan are less than 100 uh, cubic meters per capita per year. So it's really an important challenge and an, an issue in, in, in Jordan. Uh, food insecurity is another aspect. So 13% of the households are vulnerable to food insecurity. 
when we look at the energy, uh, it's another challenge uh, that's fa- that the, the, the government of Morocco is, uh, sorry, of Jordan is facing because it relies on imports, on fossil fuel imports. And this consumes about 40% of the government's budget or 20% of the national GDP. Um, so now again, how to move from the sectoral perspective and challenges to the nexus perspective. Here, uh, again, we implemented the same approach to go with the participatory workshop and to do the mapping of different uh, nexus challenges and to reach to the level where we identify the priority um, challenges and key uh, actions that we would like to take in the next steps. So the, the, if I would like to, to highlight a few examples of the mapping exercise that uh, we did with Jordan, the first was related to the water scarcity. And since I, I talked about it or give an example from the case of Morocco, let me uh, go to the other uh, challenge that was uh, identified uh, in Jordan. So agricultural productivity. And um, to, to just to quickly walk uh, together through this, about um, 70% of the planted area in Jordan is used for water intensive crops, uh, such as bananas, citrus, and others, which makes irrigation account for 60% of the total water use in Jordan. This is a huge, and in many cases is coupled with inefficient irrigation techniques, which is adding another layer of complexity. Um, to be able to produce more, the use of fertilizer is growing, and there is a tendency to, to increase this into the future. Uh, which is good in some sense. It can maybe help in improving the water, the agricultural productivity, but of course it's affecting the water quality. And uh, these conditions of the agricultural sector affecting not only the water quality, but also it's over exploiting the water resources. And I just mentioned that uh, Jordan is facing a challenge related to the water and it's considered one of the lowest water availability a country with the lowest water availability per capita. Um, and of course, when we talk about these issues or the increase in the uh, agricultural productivity, then we should take in consideration that additional energy would be required for either harvesting processes or post-harvesting processes. And to give an indication for the, ener the energy production or the energy use for food production and pumping of water, uh, of water has been estimated at 12 gigawatt hours in Jordan. Um, the use of fertilizers, as I mentioned, is affecting the water quality, but it also affects the, the, the soil salinity, which in turn is affecting the agricultural productivity in a negative way. Uh, to improve the water quality, there are plans to uh, use more energy to be able to pump from lower water levels. And also there are plans for water treatment. Al-Samra is a great example for uh, wastewater treatment, uh, but it's of course, it's generating significant amount of its energy internally, but it still, it requires some sort of energy. The desalination, the um, uh, project is also adding another layer. The supply of water, in Jordan is being um, is, is, is amazing. It's uh, water is moving from different parts to different locations, the supply and the demand. So that's a huge pumping uh, water that need to be taken in consideration and planned in a very coordinated way between the agriculture, the water and the energy sector, especially if we take in consideration the future uh, growth of this activity. And all of that should not, uh, of course, affect or we should not forget the impact on biodiversity and the, degra uh, the degradation um, of the biodiversity. So as we can see in this example, the nexus challenges are deeply interlinked. The uncoordinated mm -hmm. actions may lead to unsatisfactory results, if not to unintended consequences on other sectors. So uh, that is the importance of having this kind of mapping, this importance of having this kind of a dialogue between different sectors to be able to reach to this kind of uh, understanding and prioritizing. Um, the next, sorry, the nexus challenges that have been identified and prioritized in, in Jordan, again, water scarcity and drought was as, as uh, the top of the list, then agricultural productivity, water quality, and the shift to energy independence. Um, 
uh, as my colleague uh, um, Annette mentioned that we are still developing the analysis and this is work in progress and in the coming um, session we will talk more about the other activities related to the um, modeling exercise and the solutions uh, part of the analysis. I would like to take the opportunity to talk here about the uh, one example from the regional perspective and um, this is a study that was developed in collaboration with the United Nations Economic Commission of Europe, UNECE, uh, Global Water Partnership, and uh, a number of local stakeholders like the Sahara and Sahel Observatory OSS. And this, is, um, this study has been um, developed between 2016 to 2020, the final report was released. Um, so we have at least a full story that we can go through together. Um, the Northwestern Sahara Aquifer, again, to give some sort of a background for those who are not, not familiar with the, uh, this important water aquifer. Uh, it extends over 1 million kilometers square. 70% uh, uh, or close to 70% of its area is in Algeria. Um, that significant part is also in Libya and Tunisia. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> okay. I thought Maybe there was a close question. your microphones, please. I think there are some people with their microphone on. Um, yeah. So I, I was saying that it extends of over one million kilometers square. So it's really a, a huge um, uh, aquifer. Um, if we look at the Tunisian part, although the Tunisian share is about eight percent of the SAS region. When we compare this 8% uh, to the national territory of Tunisia, it makes about 50% of the Tunisian area is lying over this aquifer. So it is important for all the countries, not only for Algeria. Um, the population is about 4.8 or almost 5 million inhabitants. 70% are living in rural areas. So the access to the resources, the connection to the electricity is also one of the challenges that should be taken in consideration. Um, as I said, it's a massive uh, resource, groundwater resource. It has 60,000 billion cubic meter of fossil water reserves. However, the recharge rates are very low compared to the withdrawals. So we have 1 billion cubic meter per year of recharge level, uh, but the withdrawals are three times higher. So three um, billion cubic meters uh, have been withdrawn in 2016. And this trend is expected also to increase in the future. So um, it's really facing a, a great issue of overexploitation and agriculture is, um, is the main user of water in the um, Northwestern Sahara Aquifer uh, Basin. Uh, again, uh, as we started from the uh, sectoral perspective, each sector again has their own plan and their own identification and perspectives of the nexus issues, uh, or before going to the nexus, of the issues and the challenges that they are facing. And this table gives an example of um, different perspectives from different sectors. So, uh, for example, the water sector is uh, facing the challenge or would like to reduce the vulnerability and the dependence uh, of economic activities on the groundwater resource. Um, I, I mentioned agriculture, but also industry is also relying on this groundwater resource. Um, if we look at the energy, for example, 70% of the population I mentioned, they are in rural areas, but the security of supply and the, of uh, electricity, the security of supply of electricity in the rural areas is a challenge. So especially in the Algerian part where um, a great uh, population, great number of the population is in the Southern part where they are far away from the national grid and the connection uh, to the grid is a challenge for them. So they are relying on standalone systems uh, for the agricultural purposes and also relying on standalone or mini grids to be able to supply their um, even domestic needs of electricity. Uh, for the um, food perspective, uh, managing the increasing water demands and the redu and reducing the irrigation losses, knowing that 70% uh, 
of the um, uh, irrigation techniques are uh, relying on surface irrigation still, and the contribution of drip, uh, of drip irrigation is very limited in the region. The next step was to take these national, uh, these sectoral perspective into different um, uh, transboundary uh, workshops and what we call the Nexus Dialogues. That starts by the first transboundary workshop uh, brings that brings people from different sectors from different countries. Um, so we had, I think, uh, over 80 participants from um these uh, from the different sectors in the three countries and uh, where we work together on identification of these nexus challenges um the next level uh, was to do the analysis by the um, different experts in the uh, different uh, areas energy agriculture and water and then coming back at the national consultation workshop to, um, to, to show the preliminary results of the Nexus solutions and also to work with the stakeholders on the identification of the sectoral implementation, how we can take these Nexus solutions into reality and who can contribute to the implementation phase. And then uh, the feedback that have been gathered from these national consultation helped improve the analysis uh, in different angles and prepare the, um, the, the team for the second and the last transboundary workshop uh, where we focused on the packages of solutions and the cross-sectoral goals. Um, if we see uh, in these pictures, here we did a slightly different technique of uh, mapping of the challenges. And instead of looking at all the sectors together, we rather decided to go and look into the, um, the impacts from two um, sectors in each time. So energy to water and then water to energy. And here land use or agriculture on water and water uh, on land use. And at the end, putting all these interactions together to come up with um, uh, a summary table that shows all the interactions from different sectors on different resources. So to, to, to be able to read this table, uh, we look at the impact that each sector will have in each of these columns, the water sector, how it impacts the energy resources, how the water sector impacts the food resources and so on. And if I would like to take a few examples um, so the energy sector is affecting the, the food resources. So the challenges in food production in remote areas where energy access is difficult or expensive. So um, as I mentioned, 70% are rural areas, but those rural areas are not well connected to the grid. So the food production is facing these challenges of how we can supply um, uh, the energy required to, to, to practice or to get uh, the, our needs of uh, pumping for different irrigation uh, activities. Uh, and if we look at another example from the food sector, uh, increasing energy demand for multiple use and new demands for uh, water desalination and the treatment, uh, since the quality of water is, um, is facing challenges for different uh, uh, reasons, then this is bringing the question of wastewater treatment. This is bringing the questions of water desalination. Uh, here we're talking about brackish water desalination. Uh, so how much energy we need for that and how we can supply this energy and so on. Um, then uh, the next step was to develop the analysis and look for different solutions for different cases uh, for different uh, challenges. And here we had three levels of analysis or three types of the analysis. The first type was the um, qualitative analysis uh, that was looking at these uh, challenges and seeing how they are uh, affecting different resources and what can be done collectively by all the sectors to be able to mitigate these uh, risks and challenges. The other part was the qualitative analysis and the role of modeling was also apparent in this analysis where we try to select a few questions that have been of interest for the stakeholders throughout this analysis and try to develop uh, and, uh, a model 
that builds on some of the existing tools that they have to be able to quantify the benefits um, of, co of, uh, of cooperated actions between different sectors. Uh, then, of course, the participatory consultation workshops and the Nexus dialogues that have been carried out not only uh, in these workshops, but the, uh, the continuous consultation with OSS, with the other local partners and the different ministries, uh, uh, both supported the qualitative analysis and the quantitative analysis. And uh, all these together helped us to reach to a number of Nexus solutions um, uh, that we tried to put together into these 15 um, Nexus solutions and package them um, in a way that tackles different sectors, but at the same time, it will benefit um, uh, multi-sectors uh, if they are considered or, or, or developed in a way that all the sectors can get the benefits and also contribute to the implementation. And let me take an example to, 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 to make this clear. So for example, one of the solutions that have been identified in the course of this project is upscaling the use of uh, non-conventional water resources uh, through desalination, wastewater, and drainage water treatment. As I mentioned that the degradation of the water quality is bringing the question of desalination. Uh, another example, improving the reliability of the electricity grid in rural areas. Uh, and this can, um, number one, uh, help to address the, um, the, the challenge related to the food security that I mentioned before, but also it will help to improve the integration of uh, renewables if we have a better connected grid in these regions where the solar radiation are high and has a better potential for solar energy. So um, who can now implement these actions? We, we, we try to be specific and we try to uh, use the opportunity that we have all the sectors together to take this one step further, not only identify the next solutions, but also to have some sort of ownership and responsibility towards these actions. So uh, if we take, for example, the, the, um, um, the solution number five, which is related to the non-conventional water resources, we see that um, uh, the sector or the uh, institution that will take the lead here is the Ministry of the Water Resources. Here I'm giving an example of Algeria uh, and the others, and also uh, the National Office for irrigation and drainage. So um, those two have been identified by the stakeholders that they can lead the implementation of this Nexus solution and others can be um, as supporting uh, agencies that can help in the implementation of this and so on for the other uh, examples and all the other Nexus solutions. And this is an important thing that we don't leave the analysis uh, and the entire Nexus approach without identifying the sectors, without identifying clear responsibilities for each of the um, institutions or the agencies. So we move from just identifying the Nexus challenges and the solutions to having some sort of ownership, to having some sort of uh, an action plan that can be implemented um, by the ministries or the agencies uh, in order to, 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 to have these into in the real life. Um, the, sorry, uh, the, sorry, Youssef, can you wrap up in five minutes? So there yes, sure, a... sure. Perfect. Thank sure. you. Um, the other uh, element that I would like to quickly go through is the quantitative modeling that was developed in this study. And as I mentioned, um, we build on the existing model. So what we had in the basin was a model that focused on the um, water uh, perspective, uh, but the energy dimension was uh, not so apparent. So uh, the analysis focused on developing that to be able to estimate and to address a number of um, uh, questions that have been identified with the stakeholders. Uh, and this took a GIS-based approach, so we uh, have an understanding of different dimensions and char characteristics in different locations. Um, I mentioned that we looked into different uh, Nexus questions 
that have been identified with the stakeholders moving from the agricultural activity to the water demand, the energy demand, and then to the electricity supply and how we can supply the required energy demand. Um, uh, just to, to give some sense of the results or what this modeling can help us or help us. Uh, so uh, we were able to estimate or model the irrigation water demand for different countries, the three countries, but for each of the province for different type of agricultural uh, products and also to explore the impact of improving the irrigation technique, how much this will help us or how much saving in water demand we will have. Moving to the energy demand, we explored how much energy would be required for pumping, how much energy, sorry, for desalination, and how much energy would be required for pumping. And uh, what will happen if we will accept different levels of uh, salinity, different levels of TDS, uh, how much we will save in terms of uh, energy requirements. The next uh, question that we try to look into is the competitiveness of PV and moving to renewables. Uh, at which cost renewables, uh, mainly solar PV, will be competitive. Uh, so we explored different capital costs and also where this will start appearing first. So where we can, um, and this is of course based on different parameters related to the agricultural activity, the water demand, the availability of the energy resources and so on. Um, uh, lastly, we looked into, okay, now we have a very subsidized energy sector and subsidized fossil fuel um, products uh, and uh, allowing for solar to come into the picture maybe will be uh, a challenging thing. So there is a competition between the capital cost of solar and the fuel subsidies. So where should the policymakers uh, focus and where they should look if, we would if they would like to make solar competitive? And we realize that the capital cost, the drop in the capital cost of PV has a more uh, to do to make solar competitive than uh, reducing the fossil fuel subsidies in the, in the region. And this um, shows some sort of um, this dynamic. So whenever the, the, the CapEx level change, we see a significant drop uh, in PV compared to the change when the fuel level changes. Uh, so this was kind of some sort of um, uh, the insights that we uh, extracted from this modeling activities. And of course, it has the room for further development to be uh, able to address other questions in the future. Let me conclude by some of the takeaway messages. So the, um, as we discussed, um, Annette and myself, the water energy agricultural framework uh, is important to ensure the sustainable management of the water resources and also the uh, on other resources as well. Uh, the complexity of the challenges requires active stakeholder engagement. Um, the, uh, and as we go to a larger scale from subnational to the national to the regional, the involvement of those stakeholders is getting more and more importance and adding additional values that will be difficult without their involvement and engagement. The Nexus framework can be applied at different scales, and this is what we tried to show in the selected case studies. Um, the Nexus modeling is a, an important tool that, uh, yes, it has the challenge that it is data intensive and it requires a lot of inputs, but it helps to bring valuable insights for the policymakers uh, to draw the future strategies for the sustainable development of these sectors together. Um, that's all what I wanted to share. Sorry for taking too long. And uh, yeah, uh, over to you, Francesco. Uh, thank you, Youssef. Um, and very, very interesting presentation showing a lot of uh, examples. Um, actually now, uh, we, we know it's, it's slightly um, uncommon for a webinar, but we would like a bit for you to discuss uh, in breakout groups, uh, which type of Nexus solutions you encounter in the countries where you work in, sorry, Nexus challenges. Um, and uh, this is also to give a bit of a flavor of the type of very initial work uh, that is done in all these uh, case studies where stakeholders sit together and try to understand uh, which type of challenges that are across sectors 
are present in, uh, in, a, in a region, in a country uh, of work. Um, so to do so, uh, we will assign you, uh, you will be automatically assigned in a room of around six people, and then we will take you back uh, automatically after around uh, 10, 15 minutes. Um, and uh, what we would like you to do there is, uh, uh, well, it, it's just nice to know your um, the, the other people in the, uh, some of the other people in, in, this, in this meeting. Uh, but ideally you could uh, spend the first two, three minutes just reflecting by yourself, thinking if you can imagine any challenge in the nexus in your country. So any challenge that uh, uh, involves more than one sector, like the ones that we saw. So that involves more than one sector between the energy, the water and the food land sector. Uh, it could be a, a challenge that is uh, starting in one sector. So let's say if it starts in uh, uh, an example could be a new hydropower project that starts in the energy sector. But then, of course, it has nexus implication. This hydropower project might divert water from agriculture and, of course, uses water that could use, be used in, in other ways. Uh, then uh, you can, if you want, share with the other people in your meeting room some the, the possible challenge that came into your mind and see if you have any uh, commonalities in between the countries uh, that you have in, in that room. Uh, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, we cannot uh, make rooms by language. So it might be that there will be mixed languages, uh, French, English, uh, maybe Arabic in the same room. Feel free to just present in the language you're most comfortable with. Uh, and anyway, we will bring everyone back in, in 10 minutes. So I, I'll ask Jiro uh, from FAO if, if please he can divide us in, in rooms. And uh, also as moderators will uh, pop in different rooms from time to time. Okay, so I assigned the uh, breakout rooms and then you, uh, everyone gets in a pop-up window saying that uh, accept or something. So, so please accept uh, uh, once it's assigned. And I will copy these instructions in the chat. Please, if, if you want to participate to the breakout room discussion, just accept the invitation you will have your, in your screen and you will be automatically allocated to one of the rooms.
<clears throat> so the next uh, question so I am Mohammed from Bahrain. And Bahrain work, okay. Yeah, and I work in the water resource management unit. Okay. Yeah, so, I'm from and I'm in Senegal and I'm agronomist. Uh, currently I work on sludge using for products biogas and using the product to fertilize uh, the land for agriculture. So Love I can work on the both of the nature's topic. Indeed. Lovely, lovely. And also, if you are related to our field also, because we, we are part of the National Oil and Gas Authority, we were also yes. working on capturing, but not gas, capturing carbon and Using it, uh, yeah, very nice. I agree. Yeah, it's it's fun. <laughs> yeah. So, both of us, we know what we are going to say. So, uh, like the first question I speak is to identify um, an important natural challenge in our know, country. So, we can say that the most uh, I could talk about energy, <laughs> so I can talk about food. I could talk about exactly. Uh, right. <laughs> but also, but I don't know which can, which could be the most important. Also, it's on a cycle we have uh, all the used. <laughs> so if you want, I could let you start, and then I could work on it. Uh, yeah, yeah. For us, uh, to be frank, I think uh, water is very important because all our water resources are not natural. We always use uh, desalination factories. So okay. technically we don't have a water source. Uh, even our underground water is uh, diminishing. Our aquifers are way below the uh, sufficient amount that we require per year. But as you said, they are all linked together. We produce our water using gas, which is energy. <laughs> yes, gas is energy. Uh, we need water to add the cold to the digester and we need a, 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 a the the was to fertilize the soil the land for production and keep food. Indeed, indeed, it's a cycle. Yeah, that's why I talk about the cycle. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, if you think that the water could be the challenge, uh, the most challenge. Uh, okay, um, yeah, I can say that. So water, we can have water, but I don't know if we can have enough of product to to have energy. So we don't mm -hmm. have enough. We don't have enough energy in Africa. <laughs> and they, and they, Africa energy is still being a problem for living. Yeah, that fortunately for us to say that, or sorry to say that, but yeah, for us, energy is a bit of a lesser problem because we use natural gas and we do produce natural gas. But I understand that uh, one of our foresights for the future that our production of natural gas is not enough to uh, cover the requirements of Bahrain. So we understand also the fear that electricity, <laughs> if that's gone, water is gone, food is gone directly, indeed. Okay. <laughs> uh, both, uh, I, I'm, and Camila was listening to your conversation, very interesting. Uh, I'm actually from KTH uh, in Sweden. Um, uh, so I've been part of the of this FAO project uh, as, as a uh, model engineer, uh, but actually I come from Colombia. So I wanted to, to, to mention some cases because it, it, I think it's a really different landscape, right? Uh, so for example, in Colombia, we have uh, pretty much abundant yeah, yeah, yeah. resources of water, right? Yeah, exactly. So, but... Uh, then also we can we have also been facing problems, for example, in, in how to use those resources. So, for example, we tend a lot to make these huge uh, hydropower uh, power plants, right? And they, when they are functioning, they are quite nice. You know, they are quite stable. They help to balance the grid and supply energy quite stable and, and, and nicely and reduce the coal use, uh, so we reduce emissions and so on. And also they can provide any some water needs for irrigation, uh, uh, human consumption and so on. But for example, we recently had a case where we were building uh, one of the biggest uh, hydropower stations in the, in the country and it was a complete disaster. So basically the project uh, uh, had some issues when it was being finished and uh, basically the 
the reservoir almost broke. So they had to evacuate an entire zone. They, so this has the major concerns about land use, about uh, uh, societal problems, because a lot of people get displaced from their communities and so on. So I just wanted to raise that point because Nexus, uh, as we see it always as a energy where food also has some social uh, uh, problems related to it, which are also important to take into account. Correct, correct. Uh, for us also, we have a social, social aspect, uh, if I may give an example of my country, Bahrain, uh, that uh, the use of people, how, how they use the proper use of uh, water resources, they do ex excessively use water, even though we have no natural source of water. So I understand that social aspects sometimes can be a big factor. I think. Yeah, exactly. So anything else to add? Please could come back, come again, please. Sorry, I was saying just anything else to add. Okay. I more, yeah, I have no more yeah. comments here. We have a common ground that uh, is one of the main challenges. For sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. And I think it's gonna be, uh, for the future years as well. And it will increase uh, the countries that will start presenting this problem as well. Indeed. <clears throat> yeah, so it's uh, very important to start planning you know, uh, holistically. Uh, yeah, to be able to preserve the, the security in all of the sectors, right? Correct. Okay. For example, one of the sad stories that happened recently, they were starting to establish the strategy plan for the water in case of emergency, like the COVID that we are going through right now. And one of the ministries forgot to count that uh, water is related uh, to energy because we have no natural water. So we always use desalination factories. So imagine having a strategy plan that does not include the main source of your water. That's why it's always important to have all these three nexus together. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's, yes, you're right. And in, in your countries, what is the main uh, driver for water consumption? Is it agriculture? Uh, no, it's mainly uh, house use, and after that, industrial. Agriculture and industrial, they are competing. <laughs> oh, okay but uh, we lost a lot of our agricultural areas. So we have to leave in, a se in one minute. One minute, yeah. Yeah, just yes, one minute. minute. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, you. <laughs> pleasure, the same. Nice thank conversation. You. Yes, let's discuss about this uh, chat with you. Did. Have a good day. Take care. I'll stay corona free. You Take too. care. Okay. Take care. See you. So let's wait a little bit. Uh, that, that felt like I was having a, a coffee at a conference. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's nice to do what we can to <laughs> recreate that. Uh, so, that Francesco, we are back, I think. I mean, at least the people that just survived the, the breaking group, we still have a good number. You can start. Perfect. Uh, yes, so... I hope you found that interesting to speak with people from other fields and other nationalities. Um, independently, if you had the, the occasion to share your ideas in, uh, um, in the breakout room, 
or even if you're just thinking about it right now alone, it would be very interesting if you could share some ideas here with Mentimeter, as we are quite a few people. And uh, we suggest a format. Uh, you don't necessarily have to um, follow that, but we suggest that you write in the text uh, the country that uh, uh, where this uh, um, Nexus challenge that you identified is interest, uh, which sector it involves, and a short description of the challenge. So for me, an example could be Italy, energy and water, and uh, hydropower versus uh, uh, agricultural, like, uh, agricultural water use. So if you're coming in, we have someone from we have Jordan uh, that we discussed up to now, silo management, different priorities for each sector. This is something that of course raises in, in, in each country. And that's, uh, that's something that makes this kind of dialogues uh, extremely important to align and decide on these priorities. Uh, we have an example from the US between water and energy, uh, looking at desalination and water security versus greenhouse gas emission reduction. Yeah, some, some very interesting examples are coming out, more and more actually now. So looking at uh, high water intensive crops, this is for Colombia. Here there is a example for Lebanon, looking at three sectors, agriculture, water, energy. So a, a, an issue looking at water sort, shortage and, uh, and, and water treatment. In, Bra in Bahrain, seawater intrusion and uh, reduction of groundwater for climate change. And I'll see people that start commenting on the impact of climate change that of course is uh, pervasive across all water energy and, and land food sector. Now they're becoming, th thank you for all your contribution. They're becoming too many that I cannot read them all. Uh, in Brazil, beef cattle production is causing huge impacts on the environment in the water cycle. Here we have an example from Iran, water, food and environment. There is high competition between agricultural and environmental demands in Lake Urmia. Okay, I think we, we will share this. Already 20 of you have, have shared uh, some opinion. And uh, uh, if you feel that uh, you would like to uh, express more, uh, more any of these, please feel free to speak up. Uh, so I let this go, and in the meantime, I think we had uh, uh, a couple of questions from the previous session. Uh, so maybe I can uh, I can restart that. Uh, I think a common question that I will ask uh, Youssef and Annette uh, was uh, at the applicability. So how the, these nexus processes and methodologies then result in action in policy? So. Uh, can you elaborate a bit at the barrier between these projects that uh, look at the at the nexus interaction all the way to decision making? How do we get that into decisions uh, to 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 make better nexus choices? I'm sure Annette would like to start or should I? Why, why don't you start yourself? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, thanks. Uh, I think that's that's an important point, and what I try to to highlight in the example of the Northwestern Sahara Aquifer System is the level where we reach to identifying the different actors from different ministries or agencies or whoever can contribute to the implementation of these nexus um, solutions. Uh, <clears throat> of course, um, at this stage, the implement the the analysis itself. 
is some sort of uh, developing the policy uh, briefs for the policymakers. The next step would be to uh, is, is is for the for the local ministries and institutions to take this product, the entire analysis, the outcomes of the analysis, and to shape it into a formal policies and um, synergize planning steps. So everything as an input for that step is is there. That, so that's one example from the Northwestern Sahara Aquifer System. Uh, if I can go a little bit uh, outside of the Nina region, there is another um, a study where we are developing uh, a nexus assessment in a transboundary river basin in the Balkans and the dream uh, shared between Northern Macedonia, um, Albania, uh, and other countries where the outcomes of the nexus analysis is feeding into something called the SAB or the strategic action plans that will be endorsed by the uh, riparian countries. So that's an, a clear example where there is some sort of a, a hub or a mechanism that can take the outputs of the nexus study and translate them directly into policies and future plans. So I hope I, I, I answered this question. Yeah, I, I could add an, an example from California where um, increasing water insecurity is leading towards a path of desalination. But desalination <laughs> is, uh, it contradicts policies around reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so the city of Los Angeles is now looking at the possibility of uh, potable wastewater reuse as an alternative. Um, it's, it's also somewhat energy intensive, but less so than, than desalination. Thank you. So there, there are a few more questions and uh, uh, actually already people from 30 countries have added Nexus challenges. So we will look at those interestingly and we will share with everyone. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So I, I think I maybe can pass uh, the word back to our hosts from uh, FAO to some, for some closing remarks. But uh, again, I think this was a very, very interesting session and we really appreciate uh, your contribution uh, and looking at all these issues in, in the, around the Nexus. And we really hope this was a, a useful session uh, for those of you that uh, for the first time look at the Nexus, but also uh, for those of you that work with it already.